I'm Ruth Wolf. We're just going to do very brief introductions uh, first. Um, so I'm Ruth Wolf. Uh, I'm one of the members of the core teaching team for the Master of Public Health degree in the School of Public Health and one of the core instructors uh, for the course that we're going to profile today. And um, I'll just ask Hector and um, Fallon to each introduce themselves quickly, and then I'm going to just do a very short introduction to, um, to the session today. Thank you, Ruth. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Hector. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I'm a teaching assistant with the School of Public Health, and I've had the pleasure of uh, being the teaching assistant for this course and working with Ruth for a while now. Um, so my role in this instance of the course is providing student support and supervision to our student teams, which has been a thrilling and exciting process for me. So yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Hello, my name is Fallon Billick, and I am a student. So I just finished my first year of the MPH program, and I am specializing in health promotion, and I'm here to share um, my perspective as a student in this course today. Thank you both. So um, our course couldn't run without these people, both uh, teaching assistants and students. And so really excited to kind of share um, you know, what we're trying to do uh, with our curriculum and, um, and with our uh, exercises in our courses. And um, as you see, we have three perspectives uh, on this. So just to start, uh, I just want to talk a little bit as a by way of introduction um, about the development of the curriculum that I'm talking that we're going to profile today. Um, basically, um, in fall 2018, the School of Public Health um, launched a new curriculum for our Master of Public Health degree, which is a course-based uh, professional degree. This new curriculum really marked a, sh a, a very major shift from the earlier way of teaching public health in our program, where we used to highlight four, uh, five kind of siloed domains. And what we really were, our goal really was to better reflect how public health practice looks and feels in the real world. It recognizes that most public health problems are wicked problems that require complex analyses and a consideration of multifaceted, multilayered, and multi-sectoral action. And there's never one right answer or solution um, in that wickedness. We use um, broadly um, uh, a cycle called the that we refer to as the assessment planning action and evaluation cycle as a guiding framework, aligning with the main functions that master public health graduates play in the real world. And our curriculum also recognizes that preparation for practice is fundamentally different from preparation for research. Uh, while grounded in theory, preparation does require uh, experiential learning. So our curriculum is really designed um, as puzzle pieces uh, where courses are intentionally designed to build on each other. And starting uh, with an immersion course in, this, in the summer term in um, uh, mid-August for two weeks, and then following that, uh, the courses are sequenced in such a way that they, they intentionally uh, build on each other, or at least that's the goal. Um, and that's what that slide shows. You're not meant to be able to see all of that um, uh, detail on there, but it shows how the puzzle pieces work uh, over for the, for the first year. Uh, because we are aiming to work with the real world context, um, we adopted a hybrid problem-based learning pedagogy uh, for many of our courses. And a problem-based pedagogy for some of you who may not know is an active learning strategy characterized by the use of open-ended problems. And working in groups, students are encouraged to explore problem and direct their own learning as they attempt to come up with possible solutions. And during the process, instructors, and in this case also teaching assistants, take on the role of facilitators. Um, we really do distinguish um, this approach from um, <clears throat> from a case-based um, learning approach, we prepare students by providing them with uh, backgrounders as, um, as soon as they're admitted into the degree, and they're expected to become familiar with the backgrounders on, on some key problems that we identify each year. So problem-based learning really relies on learner-driven exploration of a problem, and the instructional team facilitates and guides students but doesn't direct the process. And feedback is provided throughout all individual and team exercises and assignments. Uh, and unlike a typical academic course where everything culminates in a term paper, it seems, but there are very few opportunities to reflect and get feedback for improvement. So that's a key goal. Uh, here is just a um, diagram of the process that we identify um, and, and share with our students at the beginning to try to orient them to the approach that we're using in terms of problem-based learning. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, they 
uh, come in as a background uh, with a, a broad orientation to major public health problem. Uh, in this case, we used two uh, this past year. Um, and then within those problems, each course designs its own scenario, specific scenarios, and we assign teams to both um, team uh, students, both to teams and to the scenarios that they're going to be working on. And then they're kind of um, supported to run run with it. Um, so uh, in this particular course, uh, oh, so sorry. So inco incoming students are then required to complete some preparation activities. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one of them is exposure to selected public health problems uh, that, that we will work with during their first year. And this year, the courses, uh, the problems that we worked with were related to um, two major public health uh, wicked problems, vaccination and the overdose epidemic. Um, as you can see, both very timely, although these problems already um, existed prior to COVID too. Um, and knowledge and activities are again designed to build on each other, both across the sequence of courses and within the courses. So in the next slide, um, this one just shows how in this particular course that we're profiling, which is called uh, SPH 541 Leadership and Professional Skills 1, students are assigned to teams to address a complex problem scenario. And while they are doing so, they both learn the skills for effective teamwork through an iterative process of individual homework assignments and team assignments. And in this course, the emphasis is on intra-organizational teamwork. So um, students are given a scenario in which they are uh, given a role. So it could be like you're a public health work group or you're a task team assigned by Alberta Health Services or something like that. And then um, they are expected to work through the scenario uh, to arrive at deliverables that are relevant to addressing the problem that presented with. So in this slide, we just show how the scenarios are assigned. Students are expected to um, have some of the knowledge about the problem coming in, and then they're expected to um, gain additional skills, um, knowledge, and, and then we practice skills. Uh, they apply both their individual knowledge and their skills to uh, individual team exercises and assignments. They identify their own learning needs along the way and seek support for those and identify sources of learning, which could be either their peers, their instructors or facilitators, or again, back into the readings, lectures and uh, team-based um, directed learning. We use some didactic, what we call uh, lecture ads um, in our courses. So it's a bit of a hybrid problem-based learning model. Um, and these are meant to provide um, mostly sub some substance around some of the key concepts, uh, both in public health uh, and related to the skills that students are expected to develop. Uh, this this uh, next slide uh, shows, and again, we don't expect you to be able to see all the detail here, um, but what it shows is how within the course then, um, each uh, topic is designed to build on uh, the next topic. The overriding one is really effective teamwork and leadership concepts and models, which we expect students to carry on throughout. And then, as you can see, we have um, in this course, eight topics. And these are, each topic has its own set of individual exercises. And at the end of um, the first uh, sequence, uh, there's a team assignment and an individual reflective assignment. And then we move into the second set of topics with another team assignment and an individual assignment, uh, number two, which is also a reflection. So we integrate uh, practice skills throughout and then we have these, um, this iterative process of individual assignments that can uh, exercises that contribute to team assignments throughout. And uh, today, what we're going to be profiling is team assignment two, which is the large bar at the bottom on the right, um, which is the stakeholder roundtable meeting, which is um, a, a common part of public health practice. And what we have students do with this exercise is literally simulate um, undertaking a, a uh, a round table where they have to invite, um, identify and invite uh, stakeholders from the community to participate in a discussion around uh, potential actions on the issue that the students are addressing. So with that, I think what we were going to move to now is um, that's just a very brief orientation to how the course works. And now we're going to listen to some of the students. So to frame us a little bit, we're going to be hearing, we're going to be seeing some excerpts from the roundtable discussions that three teams have provided um, in this year's iteration of this course. 
And we have classified them into several areas that we believe reflect on the development of skills and learnings from the students through the exercise. So this first round of excerpts are going to be touching on using evidence to inform the students' participations as actual stakeholders of public health agencies um, around specific issues. Um, we don't expect you to have substantive understanding of the issues. There will be about the um, narcotic overdose um, epidemic in Canada and specifically in Alberta and vaccination scenarios. But um, away from the substantive matters of it, what we really like to focus on is using evidence to inform our participation, which is what we will see right now. Our public health working group has been researching tirelessly over the past few months to do an environmental scan, research potential solutions, and come up with levers to address the issue. We have come up with some identified areas for improvement, but until we, uh, before we go ahead and jump into those, um, I would like to begin to understand um, each of your organizations better. Um, so for now, I'd like to just get, perhaps each of you could speak a little bit to what um, your position is on the current opioid uh, overdose crisis in Alberta. Um, and then just speaking evidence in general. I mean, we definitely want our decisions to be evidence-based and, um, you know, doing a rapid review that our team has done. There's a lot of support for the levers that we've suggested, but I mean, if you look at opt-out programs in general, there have been examples where they have not been effective. And really the, um, you know, the devil's in the details. It really comes down to how these programs are implemented as to whether they're successful or not. So I think there's a lot of importance in terms of being very setting specific. If we do something, uh, for example, in Stephanie's hospital, you know, hopefully something we do there might be applicable to other rural Alberta settings, but we're not suggesting that something be done province-wide because we know it's very setting specific. So um, hopefully that allays some of your concerns there. And, and just to note that this is step one in a, in a very long process. It's that about 35.6 million people suffer from drug use disorders globally in mid-2020. And substance use is one of the largest risk factors for disease burden globally. In 2017 alone, substance use cost Canada upwards of $46 billion, of which $6 billion was due to opioid use. So approximately 9.6% of adults who consume opioids reported problematic use. And between January 2016 and March 2019, an estimated 12,800 Canadians died from opioid overdoses. 2,053 of those were Albertans. In Alberta, the age-adjusted rate of opioid toxicity rate was 13.8 per 100,000 in 2016. And the number of accidental uh, opioid-related deaths has steadily grown in the province since 2011, reaching upwards of 1,100 in 2020 alone. These rates are higher in men and those with Indigenous status. The result of the overdose epidemic has placed a significant burden on the healthcare system, which has since been exacerbated by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Social isolation, reduction of essential services, rising instances of mental illness, and stress due to COVID-19 contributed to an increase in overdoses, mainly in vulnerable populations, such as individuals experiencing poverty and homelessness, BIPOC communities, and those recently incarcerated. So in public health, we refer to the opioid overdose crisis as a wicked problem, which refers to a problem that is a challenge, is both challenging and complex with many potential directions. So in response to the worsening provincial crisis, Alberta Health has created a multidisciplinary task group, which I'm a part of, to identify areas where a problem could lie and subsequent solutions could exist of action. Um, on that note, I would like to also ask to move forward with action. What data or evidence or research do you think is missing that needs to be um, assessed or collected prior to any implementation of actionable items? So where you feel like there is a gap in knowledge or a gap in understanding um, that can be pursued. Hearing from our students, we would like to now provide a discussion on what the background of this implementation of the exercise was and the process that went behind it. And that's the richness of including um, the three perspectives here, because we have three sides of um, different viewpoints that were involved in the same exercise. Um, I think we would love to hear the student side of it first. So, Valen, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, um, I would invite you to share a bit of a discussion of what you just saw and participated in, as we saw. 
Sure. No, thank you very much, Hector. And um, yeah, as Ruth mentioned, I mean, this was the culmination of a whole bunch of different pieces of work that our, our team had gathered over the course of the, the term. And um, this final product was really unique in that, you know, it wasn't a tangible document or a rehearsed presentation. It was, you know, each of us students embodying the role of a, of a stakeholder and doing a really good job of representing that unique stakeholder view. Um, I think that really resulted in us being very invested in that that piece of work because, you know, we had to we had to represent those those different perspectives. And, you know, it was challenging in that there wasn't a right answer. We were presented with a scenario and there were a number of different ways that we could go with it. And, you know, our our goal was, you know, not necessarily to, you know, check boxes of certain deliverables that were required to get a certain mark. It was about creating a defensible position. So something that we could really stand behind and, um, you know, be proud of and, and feel that we had done enough research on so that we could create that, that final stakeholder roundtable. And, you know, we were continually challenged both by um, our own teammates and by the teaching team to really think about how our levers and how our potential solutions would really impact the stakeholders that we were, um, what we were aiming to represent. So it was, it was challenging and a, a very unique final, <laughs> final product that was, yeah, that was different than any other class. I think to piggyback on, on the point you just made, I think something that struck me from the early stages of this course is that students were faced with that sort of uncertainty of where do we go from here? Because we gave them the scenarios, we gave them a brief description of what it was and what they were tasked with doing. But then they were on the driver's seat. So one of the first questions that my teams had for me is what do we do? What's the scope? What's our mindset? And in my engagements with the students, the fact that I tried to impress on them from early stages is this is up to you. You can make this project whatever you want, and it will take the shape that your team and your research and your learnings give it. And so from the early assignments, which they were all designed to build up to this roundtable, um, we tried to impress the importance of acting with a strong base of evidence. The first thing they had to do was define the problem, develop what we called a theory of the problem and subsequently a theory of the solution. And that, even though it might seem intuitive, self-explanatory, like, of course, opiate overdoses are a problem, right? But the truth is behind it is a very complex process of building theory and building practice and engaging various viewpoints into actually framing a problem and considering all the different areas that it can impact. And that's what we tasked our students with doing. And they did a superb job at incorporating actual strong evidence into creating a problem. And the interesting thing is that actually had them see the other side of the coin as well, because some of their stakeholders, they didn't have just positive stakeholders in the round table. They also had neutral or negative stakeholders. So yes, it might be a problem, obviously, but what if it's not a problem? How do we consider the evidence and the viewpoints of the interest groups and the stakeholders who don't consider it a problem? Um, so we forced our students to have a broad scope and perspective of the scenarios they were given. And they, they rose to the challenge of being comprehensive and inclusive and open-minded in um, approaching something that might seem very simple at first, but as they saw and as you've heard, it became wicked considerations. And I guess from my perspective, um, you know, as a, as one of the core instructors, we do have a teaching team. Um, you know, I'm always, I've kind of been blown away by this exercise. Um, we've, and we've done it uh, virtually, uh, obviously a couple of times now during COVID. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but what I'm always struck about is just like the the way that the students take this on. And so, you know, how they, they really access the evidence. Um, it was, which is very evident to hear. I noticed that one of the comments in the, in the chat about um, the communication um, and uh, knowledge translation or knowledge mobilization here. Um, but um, I think, you know, some of the other things that are so um, evident in um, this kind of a, of a mode um really relate to, you know, they were also able to, in a stakeholder engagement session, um, provide some simple grounding in public health, uh, you know, referencing the whole idea of a wicked problem, why this is a wicked problem. 
Um, it's a lovely example of uh, the significance of complexity in using and communicating messages to stakeholders, the nuance, um, you know, devils in the details. Uh, consideration of context is paramount. And so in considering evidence and how to use it, um, the students, um, you know, reference the fact that, you know, the context is really important and you wouldn't expect the same thing to be the case in every area. Uh, and then one of the other things that I think that, um, that they really do well in all of these is um, attention to tr determinants of health and health equity, which is something students are introduced to right from the outset of the program and expected to carry through. Uh, and then another thing that I observed was just setting the stage for a positive meeting. Um, you know, identifying this is the beginning, it's a long road, this isn't, uh, this isn't the end, you know, we're not expecting to find um, all the solutions here today. Uh, inviting engagement and the need to consider evidence further. So what, what more would you need to be able to uh, consider the, the things that we're proposing um, better? And then, you know, as we saw in the reflective comments that students made, um, you know, as students reflected, they shared their experience of discomfort, um, uh, you know, uh, as they worked through the uncertainty in the problem-based learning space. Um, as Fallon said, you know, often uh, students work on a on a paper, um, you submit it at the end, right? And um, and it often it's very individual work, even when there's group work involved in a course. Here, we really do expect the students to work as a team and to pay attention to their team dynamics um, at the same time as they're developing their skills in assessment um, and planning in this uh, stage of the course. And yet what I noticed in the, um, the videos in all of these cases was that the uncertainty is not at all apparent in these stakeholder roundtables. Um, what we see is where the students um, uh, uh, come across as being um, adept um, and very knowledgeable um, about the positions that, that they're taking and the roles they play. So I'm going to talk about perhaps one of the most exciting pieces of this exercise is the simulation or the application of a real life situation that we put our students in. So give them the opportunity to see how the interpersonal dynamics actually develop in um, discussions and decision-making processes of um, public health. And it it's interesting to see the perspective that they got and the reflections they made on what it meant for them as future practitioners with the mindset of this is going to be my work environment in the future. So um, now, we're going to see some more excerpts from our discussions. So um, I really loved how the conversation really flowed. You guys all did fantastic research for your roles. Like even there were some parts where I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I should look into that. So um, it was a really good, like, I didn't know what you would come in with moment because I it was like a surprise moment. So I really, um, I liked that portion. You guys played your roles really well. Um, you had your... Um, what's it called? We had our uh, little bit of moments where we were like, oh, like, is that conflict of tension? So um, I really appreciated that. Um, um, in terms of like the conflict that emerged, I think that's a good thing. I think if we didn't have conflict, we wouldn't be like representing the right stakeholders. I think that's like probably one of the criteria, quote unquote, is that you have to like see how different perspectives are going to come together to like have the action. And I think you're right. Um, in terms of like the outcome and moving forward is uh, similar to like what Malvika also just talked about is we need to like assess the true feasibility of some of the potential solutions and like you know it might sound nice in theory and like kind of upon for a second it might be like yeah we could totally do like cleanups but then like what are the implications behind that as well and that would garner and require a lot of more meetings and hours I think when we jumped into this, we were like, wow, an hour, that's so long. We're like, are we going to run out of stuff to talk about? And then we're actually filming and we're like, wow, we're like 30 minutes and it's like introductions. So I think, yeah, I think like what I guess we could have done better as a group probably was like anticipate timing, which was good though, because I think our dry run really like hit us in the face. Oh, we might actually be a little bit short for timing, if anything. Yeah, like we... We did. We thought we like were pretty good, pretty productive during that meeting. But we we had so much more that we could have talked about. And like this really does relate to like real life situations where you're stuck in these policy meetings over and over again with the same people, and you're kind of like getting sick of each other's faces <laughs> um, because you know where that person is coming from. But like you're, they're just bringing more information each time. And um, Malvika, you made a really good point about. Um, 
serving certain populations and um, kind of disadvantaging others, disadvantaging others, um, which I think that we've really talked about along like the whole way across our, our public health journey so far is that, yeah, you're, it's, it's kind of, especially when there's money involved, it is a pie. And when one part of the pie gets more, like you get you a lot more to that section, somebody else loses out maybe. Um, but I think it is really important, especially in um, the context of drug use, where we're talking about um, vulnerable populations that we do kind of keep that idea of justice and equality in mind. So we're, we're already talking about populations who have a minuscule, we're starting with this minuscule uh, piece of the pie. Yeah, it really gives you a sense of what goes on behind closed doors and like how long it takes to get anything done and why interventions take so long. <laughs> I think uh, when it when we do virtual meetings, it really helps to encourage all of us because we have to sit and wait our turn and put our hand up that to, I guess, ultimately, as my mom would put it, be quiet and listen. <laughs> so when, you know, you sit and you listen, you're able to hear what everyone's saying, and then it almost supplements what you want to say next. And it just kind of makes the conversation better. Okay, so Fallon, could you tell us, and you have the biggest perspective here, what this exercise meant for you in terms of a shift on what you were used to and now what the dynamics were? Yeah, no, it was um, it was a challenge. And admittedly, and I think I can speak candidly here, there was a lot of pushback from students. And I'm sure you as a teaching team heard it about, you know, not being comfortable working in this gray area without having really explicit instructions about how to tackle these problems. Like it was, we wanted to know what the teaching team wanted. Like, what does the teaching team want? And we kept getting pushback. It's not about what the teaching team wants. It's about how we are going to address our scenario. How are you going to address the problem? So instead of, you know, we would ask, you know, how many references, how many bullet points, how long should this section be? The answer kept being, it depends. What are you trying to say? Who are you communicating with? What's your point? So we would get different at, and we would even compare between teams. Well, <laughs> the teaching team lead said this, and my teaching team said this. We really had to shift our focus from this academic focus to a project management focus. And I think that was, you know, once you hit that aha moment of, you're not going to get your, your check boxes and your list of what to do. It's up to you to stand behind your work and, and do the best you can with the information that you have available. Then, you know, that's, that's when we started being really effective. And, um, and just to address Brad's comment in the chat box, there was a little bit of upfront work um, in the beginning of the course to really articulate what the qualities of good and effective teams and leadership were. And that, that helped, you know, and how those things are shaped by our own life experiences as individuals, our own biases, those things that we're bringing to the table that we don't even realize that we're bringing to the table. So that helped us lay a really strong foundation. We developed a terms of reference on how we were going to communicate, how we're going to be accountable to each other. And that helped develop trust within the team. Because so often in teamwork, you know, one of two things can happen. You can either just go to consensus and, and you don't really get those diverse perspectives, or you can split up and, you know, try to have piece together a whole bunch of individual work that doesn't really come together. And, you know, in this, because we were, we were playing stakeholder roles, I mean, we, we had to rely on each other. We couldn't know what those other people were going to bring to the table when they were, you know, playing their stakeholder. So um, there was a lot of trust there. And, and it was a definite, it was a significant departure from what we were used to, but I feel like it, it helped us to create a far better product at the end and, and give us some skills that would be transferable to real public health practice. So that it was building confidence and being confident in ourselves and in our teams and to get the job done. So it was, it was challenging. There was some pushback, yeah. but overall it was, it was a great experience. <laughs> I think one of the most amazing things about universities and academic contexts is that it's a sheltered environment. It's a place where we share discussion and opinions for the sake of knowledge, and we advance science. And that's a wonderful thing, but it's also a limitation because in practice circles, in, in the quote-unquote real world, getting things done means much more than that. 
it means much more than sharing an opinion and discussing a paper and having a lecture. There are interpersonal dynamics. There are, as Fallon said, personal biases, unconscious biases that they all play a role in, in how the machinery functions and moves. And the big thing about this exercise is we asked students to step away from this bubble we had created for them where everything was certain, it was safe, you could rely on um, a blueprint to guide your thought into establishing their own train of thoughts in deciding what was right, deciding what was wrong, considering what an office or an institution would um, see as right or wrong and what perspective they would bring to a specific problem. Um, and that takes a huge um, feat of maturity and sober thinking on the part of our students. And they did wonderful in uh, building the base for it, which as Fallon mentioned, um, the gelling of the teams, and we always stress this is a team project, it's not a group project. You have to um, rely on your teammates. You have to build strong connections because when you get to that stakeholder roundtable discussion, it will play in your favor. And I'll speak on my personal experience. I worked closely with Fallon's team on this project. Um, they created such strong team dynamics that it really propped everyone up. They all relied on those structures that they all had because they've been in contact and developing this project for a long time. And then when it was time for them to step away and acquire conflicting, sometimes synergistic, but sometimes antagonistic perspectives on the same problem, um, the fact that they trusted one another so much, um, really, it, it, it was a huge benefit in allowing them to represent these stakeholders appropriately. And more than that, it, it, helped, it helped them see what the relationships are like in these actual circles when people meet to discuss a problem. Um, and I think that application of this is what your scope of work might look like in the future is a look into public health practice that we cannot get from a paper, from a lecture, from reviewing a video, from reading a book. Um, and it's the huge value of this exercise is that even within our sheltered environment of the university, we push them out of the comfort zone and we ask them to consider what it's like for a person, for a human, to try and tackle such a complex issue. Uh, I'll just add, add on a couple of comments, uh, not to take up too much time on this section because we have another an another set of snippets shortly. Um, but uh, just to add, you know, this um, both um, uh, Hector and Fallon in particular, you know, uh, highlighted the. Um, the nature of sort of the team um, development, team dynamics in the course. And of course, we do have students with a wide range of backgrounds, right? Some students have worked in practice, some have never worked in practice. Um, and so what was interesting to see was that even some of those who had quite a lot of um, practice found the exercise valuable in, in taking a different position, right? Trying to find a, a different spot and seeing things from a different angle. But just kind of leading into this, um, one of the things we did do at the beginning around um, this area of, of bias is the course, one of the courses that precedes this one um, really emphasizes um, engagement for public health practice and um, self-awareness as you come into practice. And so um, it actually focuses on philosophical um, concepts, uh, epistemology, uh, ontology and really encourages students to think about their own moral and ethical stances in a wide range of very challenging public health issues. And uh, could you lead if you didn't, could you lead this initiative if you were, um, a, if your own personal views were opposed to it? And so students come in with that self-awareness, and I found this um, very much evident uh, in the courses. That said, we have a long way to go in terms of walking the walk around um, working with anti-oppressive practice, um, uh, anti-racist practice. So we did, uh, and this year we did um, introduce um, that at the very beginning. In the past, I think we've really relied on really mainstream notions of leadership and uh, effective teamwork. Um, we've introduced readings in the past, but this year we actually had um, a little bit more of a focus on this um, with resource people bringing in, you know, how you can integrate these um, other approaches, um, you know, 
uh, uh, into uh, thinking about leadership and practice. And, and as, as, as uh, Mandy pointed out in the comment, uh, recognizing what your social location is in your team. Um, and, um, you know, it doesn't always work. It's not always successful. It's a process, right? We're all on a learning journey, but um, I think it made people more aware of what was happening um, in their team dynamics. Um, and, um, you know, just as the segue out of this course, many of these students are now just starting a two-month uh, course that builds on this set of um, uh, courses. Um, and now they're working with external partners on a problem for the external partners. And so, you know, now they're really kind of thrown into the wild, right? Like if they were uncomfortable in these courses, they built up some confidence. Um, but now they really are challenged to work with an external partner organization. And then sequence wise from this, they would go into their field practicum um, as, in, as individual students. But in this one, uh, course that's starting now, they're again assigned to teams, they're assigned to projects, they don't have a choice um, of team or project and, um, and they're running with it. So they're starting this week. So I'll keep my comments there. And um, so we can have enough time to go into the next segment. And so now we will hear students. This is from the last section of the roundtable discussions, which we call the debrief. It's where students really reflected on how they did and what it meant for them. And throughout these courses, it's a million and one reflections. And I know it might seem tedious if you're not familiar with the course, but it actually does build on this fact that we're trying to create professional skills and seeing the reflections is really, it's fantastic. And all the, sh all, all the comments we've been sharing on the slides are actual quotes from reflections that show the student's perspective on it. I think the biggest thing for me is that um, I think we did a really good job of bringing in kind of all of the things that we've been working on. Stephanie, you did an amazing job kind of going over um, our systems diagram, our theory of the problem. We talked about our theory of the solution. We talked about our rapid reviews. I answer these, but at the same time, I felt super well prepared because I felt like I drew upon all of our team's work. And like, just to reiterate kind of what we were chatting about before we even started recording, like this team has been excellent. Like everyone has come to the table and produced like such high quality work. So when I was, you know, a lot of the agenda and all of the key messages, it was, you know, copying and pasting of work that we had all contributed to before. So it made it easier to to moderate that because I felt like we had had a lot of these discussions before. So truly like kudos to all that background work. I think I forget who said it before, but this really did feel like the culmination of like all of these previous weeks, like it all kind of came together. So it's nice to see kind of how all those separate pieces fit in together for um, a piece of work like this. So I thought it came together. Um, really well. For me personally, I like even things that you were saying that we had researched before I caught myself like thinking about them in a new light and being like, Oh gosh, like I didn't even think about that aspect of it. How do we address that? So it it, it definitely hammered the nail on the, like, this is a very complex issue. Um, and all we can do is just keep trying, keep learning, keep researching and like keep addressing it moving forward. I don't know. For me, I was like this tension about how I want to portray this like business representative. So like, I don't know how hard and like, firm I should be uh, so I was like I feel like wavering from being very like wanting to create a lot of tension and then trying to be a little bit more diplomatic so I, I feel like it was it was interesting like preparing for this and trying to think about how I wanted to reflect um, that and kind of portray portray this role I'm going to borrow Fallon's word culmination because that's something we heard over and over in the reflections is that this was an integrative process and the round table really just tasked them with applying everything they had learned and practiced and exercised up until that moment. Um, so Fallon, what did this mean for your portfolio of skills and how did you engage all these skills together? It was really confidence building again, like just being allowed that autonomy on how to approach the problem. And even though it was sort of resisted at first, you know, foisted upon us, this autonomy, it, it led to a lot more ownership of our work, you know, and I think that 
that's a really positive thing when you take ownership for what you're producing and you can stand behind it. And, you know, what we're seeing here today is the, the last piece, the round table, but there were so many different layers. And again, it wasn't a group project. It was a team. Like we had some pieces of work that we pulled together as a team, but then we had to, to do some pieces that were individual. So you, you were challenged to think, you know, how can I as an individual add value to this product that my team started or vice versa? Here's a piece of work I'm doing individually. Now we're going to come together as a team. How can we, how can we bring this all together and make sure everyone's views are represented? So all those different layers of teamwork, individual work, and then culminating in this round table, it really built off each other in a, in a really nice way. And it led to a lot of accountability. Um, I think, especially in, in university, sometimes the group project gets, you know, there can, it's challenging to do a good job of it, probably both from the student perspective and the instructor perspective, but there was a lot of accountability built into this. And, and I feel like a lot of trust that was built as well. So it was, it was unique and, and very well done. I think it really was unique and something that we always were open about in the communications is that this wasn't like a straightforward linear process that you're going to start an A, move on to B, move on to C, and that's going to be it. And you'll never have to look back. Um, we always told students that every assignment built on the next um, and towards the next. So that sense of, yeah, what Fallon said, accountability is um, the products that we ask them each week were intended to inform the next product. And without getting ahead of ourselves with the teams, we always um, ask them to bear that in mind because they would need to use that information again to inform something else. And I think that framed the mindset for our teams and for the teaching team as well. Of every assignment has a purpose. It's not just to check. It's not just to mark. And it really has to produce something that's tangible, that's usable. Um, with that level of um, pragmatic thinking, I think our students benefited from um, implementing theoretical skills, but to actual um, situations, and they could see a product from it. So, yeah, so I think what, you know, what we really wanted to do was, you know, profile, you know, how this course is integrative in, in more than one way. So, um, you know, it integrates, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, um, skills and uh, concepts from the other courses that precede it. Um, and then this is a, a wonderful um, way, we think, to um, have the course activities themselves uh, build on each other. Um, and, you know, I will say, and this is kind of like echoes a little bit what Fallon said earlier, you know, in the first, um, this is the first in this series of courses where we work like this with this team assignment to scenarios. Um, and, um, you know, with this kind of, um, in, in a way, creating this context of uncertainty, right, or discomfort where students don't really, they, they think they are supposed to find the right answer. Um, and they always start out, this is the fourth year with this course, and um, they've always started out, you know, very uncertain, uncomfortable, frustrated, even kind of irritated. And I would say like angry sometimes um, at the instructors um, about the expectation um, around this, um, that there's no one right answer and really that they have to figure it out uh, for themselves, of course, with our, our guidance. Um, one of the things that really has struck me in this exercise um, uh, and I'll say, especially in the virtual space, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you know, the role playing required a lot of preparation in both substance and performance. Um, and we didn't hear uh, clips here, but, you know, in each of these teams um, that are represented here, um, one of the students played the role of a client or a user, um, somebody who'd be affected directly by whatever actions um, are taken and by the problem itself. And they played a, just an amazingly important um, role in contributing to the considerations. Um, so whereas there could have been some tensions along the way in, um, you know, judging the relative contributions and quality of the work within a team, the opportunity to take, as, as Fallon said, you know, take a role and, and um, take responsibility and be accountable to it and make it your own really made every individual in the team shine. And um, I think one of the observations I had was that even in some of the teams, you know, not necessarily these teams that we're showing today, but in some of the teams, you know, there had been some tensions around um, 
relative contributions. And one of the things that I felt really came through in some of the reflections was a real increased appreciation for their teammates. Um, you know, that they, they saw how their teammates really um, did go to bat and do the work, right? And come, came in really well prepared for their role. We didn't tell them how to play those roles. We didn't give them the information about who the roles should be, right? They had to come up with those and do their own stakeholder assessment. Um, and then the other thing that I think was really clear just from a public health um, perspective and perhaps any stakeholder engagement perspective is, you know, as um, as that final um, uh excerpt showed, you know, a perspective, it turns out, is not one perspective. There was recognition that a particular perspective comes with multiple views. Uh, so a business person, you know, all business people aren't on the same side of an issue. Um, so I think it was a really critically important um, insight for the students to have. Um, and the fact that these meetings, um, as one student said, hammered home the complete complexity of the issue. Uh, so at the culmination, they were able to see how the puzzle started to come together and they felt it had been rewarding um, they appreciate that you just have to do the thing um, and work through the uncertainty certainty and the discomfort. So just in closing um, our comments before we have a chance to have a bit more of a chat, um, why did we call it no going back? And really, I guess I'm the only one that can have a perspective on this aspect, uh, Mauricio perhaps as well um, as our uh, instructional designer in the school. Um, but having worked this exercise in both campus face-to-face -face and virtual modes, there is just no doubt at all that this assignment works much better in the virtual mode. Uh, students took it more seriously. They did an incredible integration of their own learning and were able to run with the experience in this mode. Um, the teaching team didn't hover, although we provided the support, as um, probably Hector did provide um, some of, um, among the, the best support I've ever seen of students. Um, and... Uh, um, that was very important, but we didn't hover over their round tables like we did in the classroom or interrupt them um, or, you know, offer our ideas as they were doing it, as we did in the classroom setting. Uh, the students took time to integrate their knowledge and their perspectives in preparing for their roles. Um, and it's very clear, you know, in the, in the uh, excerpts. Um, but one of the, as one of the students said, the video format and the virtual etiquette also created a more level playing field for the team members. So I think that was a really important piece and something that was a little bit of an aha moment, I think, um, at the end, because, of course, you know, we're all kind of tired of virtual learning. Um, but there is its, it, it has its place. And I do hope that we will continue in our program, at least to uh, continue with some of this virtual um, work. Um, the other thing that came through that didn't here, I think, that didn't come through as much in a classroom was the, the messiness of, this, of a stakeholder roundtable in the community is really on display um, in terms of the different perspectives that come in, the fact that moderators have to navigate these different things. It can't be so scripted. And these were clearly not scripted um, dialogues. And finally, it was a better bait demonstration, I think, of the results of problem-based learning where students are truly responsible for, as Fallon said, you know, making it happen. Uh, so unless uh, Hector or Fallon have any other final comments they want to make, that I, I'll close my comments there. And um, we're happy to um, engage in some discussion with the limited amount of time we have left. Yeah, we have a few minutes, but just to give an acknowledgement to everyone who was involved in making this course happen, our teaching team and the students who, Fallon, who represented them here and those who consented to their work, we couldn't be more grateful. And they had a tremendous impact in our school.